From an ongoing worldwide pandemic to the highest inflation rate in four decades, an increasingly assertive China and Putin's appalling invasion of Ukraine, the agenda welcomes foreign affairs experts to discuss what they witnessed in 2022, Canada's place on the world stage, and what they expect will play out across the globe in 2023. And with that, let's welcome in London, UK, Lise Doucette, Chief International Correspondent with BBC News, and we should add, a proud Canadian. In Calgary, Alberta, Shivaloy Majunder, former Policy Director for Conservative Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird. In New York, New York, Ian Bremmer, President of Eurasia Group and author of the book, The Power of Crisis, How Three Threats and Our Response Will Change the World. And in La Conception, Quebec, Jennifer Welsh, Professor of Global Governance and Security at McGill University and Director of its Center for International Peace and Security Studies. And we are delighted to welcome the four of you back to our program tonight. Happy New Year to everybody. I want to start with a comment here from the deputy editor of The Economist, who wrote the following last year. In retrospect, he wrote, the pandemic marked the end of a period of relative stability and predictability in geopolitics and economics. Today's world is much more unstable, convulsed by the vicissitudes of great power rivalry, the aftershocks of the pandemic, economic upheaval, extreme weather, and rapid social and technological change. Unpredictability is the new normal. There is no getting away from it. Okay, let's pick up there as we look back at 2022. In terms of world trends, in one sentence, one sentence, let's start with this. What was the big 2022 headline for all of you? Lee, start us off. Well, I'll cheat and take the word that was the word of the year for Collins Dictionary, and that was permacrisis, the forever wars we often talk about, except now it's a climate crisis, an economic crisis, and the global crisis provoked by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and a lot of wars in the margins, too. Permacrisis is a good word. Chivaloy, what would you say? I would say uh, authoritarian disruption and economic polarization have spiked simultaneously. Um, and we see that manifest in what the Western world, the democratic world now has to confront in the context of two rivalries emerging at the same time, both Russia and China operating in different means, but drawing the world into an economic decoupling. We will surely come back to those themes. Ian Bremmer. One sentence, uh, the permanent end of a 30 year peace dividend uh, in Europe and for the West. Permanent, eh? You, you feel comfortable saying permanent? I mean, you gave me one sentence. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, to be continued, fair point. Jennifer, to you. For me, in one sentence, it would be the acceleration of catastrophic risks and the hardening of blocks in the world that makes uh, negotiation and resolution of conflict more difficult. Okay, let's do some following up then. Ian, I'll start with you on that. Michael Hirsch, the columnist from Foreign Policy Magazine, called last year, the year the good guys meaning the democracies, struck back. Do you also see democracies making a comeback against authoritarian regimes? A comeback may be too strong, but I, I think it's the year that people recognize that they panic too much, that the institutions actually have resilience and stability. It's true in my country, the United States. It's true in yours, Canada. It's true in Brazil, uh, the largest economy in South America and a peaceful transition of power. It's also true in the European Union, perhaps most importantly, uh, despite all of the crises, and in fact, in some means because of the crises, the EU today has a stronger health policy, defense policy, fiscal policy, and energy policy than at any point since it was created. Uh, and that's a pretty big deal for the most important piece of supranational governance that exists in the world today. Chivaloy, are you similarly as bullish on democracies this year? I think that we're seeing a lot of the institutions that were established to manage the Cold War uh, now grappling with modern realities of technology, uh, whether it's in climate and energy or um, in, in any other means. So I'm, I'm more concerned about how new alliances are built atop of modernizing alliances and how our institutions, which had managed the Cold War, uh, are now adapting. So I think I think there's a lot of room for growth in that. And I think that a lot of what we're seeing in the Western world is a reorganization of how 
uh, the concept of trust is underpinning mutual security and mutual prosperity. Jennifer, can I get you that on that as well? I think for democracy, it's been a, a, a mixed year. We've seen really graphic illustration of the staying power of the democratic spirit in Iran, even in China. But, you know, we've seen some fundamentals that are still very worrying. If we look at the rise of or the continuation of disinformation, of populism, of polarization, although we've had some elections like in Brazil and France where populists appear to be on the back foot, we can't say that everywhere. And of course, two of the world's largest democracies, India and Indonesia, have seen really troubling trends this year with Modi's continued efforts to erode civil liberties. And in Indonesia, we've also seen restrictions on free speech, restrictions on um, on gay relationships. So, you know, when you look at the numbers and you look at the trends, I think we can't be too complacent. And I think that was the problem for much of the period that Ian was talking about. Democracies were incredibly complacent about their staying power. And now we see the economic pressures really pushing a number of countries. And this year, I think we'll be watching for instability caused by economic pressure. Well, if there was one thing, Lee's, that shook democracies out of their complacency, as Jennifer just put it, uh, it surely would have been Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I want to pick up our story with you on that, because you spent so much of the past year in Ukraine covering that story. I, I don't want to ask you about battlefield strategy at the moment. I want you to sort of give us, uh, given the time you spent there, your understanding now of what the average Ukrainian family has been experiencing over the past year. Well, I think when it comes to Ukraine now, we shouldn't use words like average or normal because everything has been turned upside down and inside out in Ukraine. Ukraine is a profoundly different country now. The past is a different country. I think the war in Ukraine, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, even to the, the last days before, both Ian and I were at the Munich Security Conference. Um, and still there, they were hoping against hope that the invasion wouldn't happen with just days uh, to go. But once it did happen, I think what we've seen unfolding on the battlefield is an upending of we overestimated Russia's military strength and strategy. We underestimated Ukrainian uh, strategy and strength. And when you look at the Ukrainians now, it has taught us a lot about war as well and reminded us that wars are always about metal and metal, the metal of the tanks, what is a steady flow of arms and ammunition coming from the West, including from Canada, uh, but also the metal, the spirit of the people. And I have to say, I was there most recently in November where the effect of Russia's attacks on the energy grid were biting with power cuts uh, and freezing uh, freezing uh, basements where people had to retreat because of the strikes and not a single person was rumbling and not a single person in all of the days I've spent in Ukraine over the last year, I've not met a single Ukrainian who doesn't believe that Ukraine can and will win this war. Hmm. Ian, how would you explain that metal, M-E-T-T-L-E, -T of the Ukrainian people. 44 million people invaded. Uh, incredible uh, courage, charisma, and leadership from the president uh, and from the government as a whole. Uh, and in relatively uh, quick order, the fact that uh, NATO uh, really did band together and provide enormous support. The Europeans have now through nine rounds of sanctions, 27 countries have unanimously voted in favor of those sanctions. The United States, uh, together particularly with Poland and the United Kingdom, have provided an enormous amount of military uh, support uh, for the Ukrainians. Uh, so they're not standing alone, even if it might have felt that way uh, in the early days and weeks uh, of the war. Uh, it's been extraordinary uh, to watch. And as I said, unfortunately, the downside here, I did say permanent, the end of the peace dividend, there's no way back for Putin. Having made this immense misjudgment, Ukraine is now militarily incredibly capable. You can't get that genie back in the bottle. The Ukrainians wouldn't allow it. NATO is expanding. You're not gonna turn that away. The Germans, even the Japanese, uh, who also share a border with Russia, are now going to be spending 2% of GDP on defense. And the pipelines that used to bring gas to Europe, that's over. 
Nord Stream 1 and 2, of course, have been sabotaged. It's going to take years and years to rebuild those pipelines so the Russians can bring gas someplace else. This is a very serious problem for Vladimir Putin, who has now become the leader of the most powerful rogue state, frankly, in history. Having said that, Shivaloy, I wonder how discouraged we ought to be uh, by the fact that the so-called Global South uh, has not responded in a similar fashion at all. In fact, many of them have... You know, I guess the equivalent would be they pleaded the fifth on all of this and said, not our affair, we're not interested. What should we take from that? I think what we're seeing is um, the democratic world uh, is, first of all, grappling with the concept of a two-front challenge, one with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the second with the consolidation of authoritarianism in Xi Jinping's China. Uh, and for the global south, the developing world, emerging economies, uh, a critical question for them is how do they improve their quality of life? Uh, and with the center of gravity of global growth moving across the Indo-Pacific region, uh, these are countries looking to modernize infrastructure, develop long-term energy supply, uh, have the kind of partnerships that get the job done for yearning populations. And so until uh, the Western world, the democratic world, prepares the military and economic arrangements that speaks to that self-interest, I think that they will continue to look at the Russian invasion of Ukraine as Europe's war and not their own, when in fact the reality is that much of what Russia is trying to accomplish in Ukraine is underpinned by China's finances. Jennifer, can I get you on that as well? How discouraged should we be by the fact that a huge important country such as India or frankly almost all of Africa uh, seem quite ambivalent to this whole thing? I think it was a year in which the Global South's position on Ukraine was very discouraging and dismaying for a lot of, of Western countries. I would add to the list of what you just mentioned, uh, South Africa. But, you know, we need to dig a lot deeper into the reasons for their ambivalence and, in some cases, real uh, disappointment with the West. I mean, in some cases, it is about trade, as Shuvaloy mentioned. In some cases, it's about the help that they receive from the Wagner Group, the Russian-backed mercenaries. And in some cases, it's a result of historic ties, as it was with South Africa and, and the Soviet Union's support for apartheid. But they fundamentally see a lot of hypocrisy in the West. The claim that you know uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine was the biggest threat to the post-war order, it, it doesn't look that way in a lot of countries in the global south. While the Ukrainian war was waging, there was also a devastating conflict in Ethiopia that many did not you know, pay attention to. So I think this bigger picture is one that we really need to understand in more detail because each country has their own reasons. Ian, I think I've heard you say that you, you call Russia the most dangerous rogue state in the world today. Uh, let's get some more flesh on that bone. What do you mean by that? Well, what I mean um, is that I think the broken relationship between Russia um, and the G7 uh, and America's critical allies around the world among the advanced industrial democracies, I, I think is broken and can't come back. So when I think of a rogue state, I think of a country like Iran, Right, which which uh, the sanctions against Iran um, are uh, pretty staggering, and as a consequence, over the last decade, the Iranian economy has shrunk by some forty percent. Um, that Russia is just beginning that process. But when you talk to countries in the Middle East, whether it's Israel or the Saudis or others, they see Iran as the principal enemy in the region, and they. The Iranians are engaging in, it's not about nuclear weapons, it's about cyber attacks, drone attacks, ballistic missile strikes, espionage. Well, that's what we mean when we talk about a rogue state. Now, if Russia is no longer an acceptable great power on the global stage, but instead a rogue state, then that's the way that frontline NATO countries are going to increasingly think about Russia, not as a country you trade with or you engage with, not as a country that you can sit down and have effective diplomacy with, but rather one you have to guard against because they're using every means possible to attack you. And you, in return, are trying to punish them. You want the regime out. I mean, that, that that's the reality, is that Western policy against Russia is not just a Cold War. It's essentially a hot war by proxy. Now, that's Russia's fault, but it's still a reality. And that's an incredibly dangerous reality as we look forward to 2023 and, frankly, well beyond that. Well, let's continue to do that. Let's look forward and figure out, as you call it, this hot war by proxy, how this ends. 
Um, okay, Chivaloy, start us off on that. How does this thing, I mean, all wars end eventually. How does this one end? Listen, you're asking me to predict in an unpredictable environment, so <laughs> I'll take the first gamble at this. Um, I think that um, in the context of Russia's war in Ukraine, we're going to see uh, this, in, this idea of gradual support for Ukraine be replaced by a Ukrainian victory. So I'll, I'll, I'll boldly go out and suggest that the Ukrainian professional armed services, the people have endured so much through so much courage, they're going to demonstrate to the democratic world what that metal and metal means to borrow Lisa's uh, excellent frame earlier. Um, in terms of the, the, the organization of how uh, the economy of the world would be structured, I think that as governments begin to grapple with the permanence of Xi Jinping in Beijing, uh, and we engage the G20, and this year, as you know, India is hosting the G20. Um, I think that a lot of the uh, corridors of trade, of commerce, that would be underpinned by the so-called concept of the rule of law uh, are going to see um, many lateral arrangements around the world cooperating more closely around supply chains that build more resilience, uh, even while um, economic consequences of post-pandemic spending, um, fantasy thinking around energy and energy transition. As these realities come to ground, I think that uh, as we engage the G20, we're going to start seeing a different model for how uh, the world's democracies begin to collaborate and how their proposition to the emerging economies of the world uh, provide for longer-term partnerships. Well, let's get one more comment on this. Jennifer, uh, I mean, Shuvalo is quite right to say it's it's impossible to predict in an unpredictable world how this thing is going to end. But but I know there are people whose job it is to imagine how this happens. So, uh, le you know, let me put the spotlight on you and say, could we see a Cyprus-like situation here where perhaps some parts of Ukraine are under UN supervision? And is that a potential way out of this? Well, you know, I, I, I'm loath to predict, but I think, you know, it's, when we look at past wars, there's roughly three ways that they can end. One is through negotiation, but at the moment we see neither side in good faith wanting to do that. Russia claims that it wants to negotiate, but it seems to want Ukrainian capitulation first. It could end through victory. I think I, like many, are predicting more of a, of a stalemate, continued uh, in, incredible bombardment by uh, Russia on Ukrainian cities. Uh, but a third way is through some sort of, you know, neither complete victory nor complete defeat and a form of international supervision. The difficulty here is Russia's seat on the UN Security Council and its capacity to control whether that could happen through UN means. So I think we're a ways from, from that solution. But the idea of a stalemate going into 2023, I would gingerly su suggest is likely. I do think we need to look behind the U.S.'s steadfast support for Ukraine, however. I think it's impossible for Joe Biden right now to not publicly appear to be 100 percent behind. But there may be rumblings from other parts of the United States. We even heard it from some U.S. generals trying to encourage Ukraine behind the scenes to consider a form of, of negotiation. For the U.S., the economic impact of the war is very bad news. Uh, and that kind of pressure, I think, will continue. Okay. Let us, uh, let me set up this next question by saying that we used to do these foreign affairs first week of January look aheads uh, with a guy named Matthew Fisher, who was the longest serving foreign correspondent uh, for a Canadian media outlet, uh, I think, ever. And, um, you know, Matthew died a couple of years ago, but he used to have this line, which I want to uh, uh, replicate for all of you right now. Because it was a very good line. Matthew used to say, there is no country in the world that does less and says more than Canada. <laughs> and Lise, given your perch as a Canadian, but covering things from overseas, let me get you to weigh in on that. Is he right about that? At times like this, where it's a moment, certainly in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, for its allies to stand up 
and be counted, not just to be seen, not just to do, and it's a symbolism and substance. Canada has made sure it has not just been doing something, but it has been, been seen to do something. It, of course, is in the G7. It is in NATO. It has been, as to quote, to take Matthew, Matthew's comment, it has been saying all the right things. And I think when it comes to Ukraine doing what it can within the resources that it can make available. It is not a military superpower like the United States. It doesn't have the soft power of some of the European countries involved in this war. But I think Canada has certainly been counted. And I know from going to Ukraine, when I say I'm Canadian, there's, without, without exception, a very warm response, partly, of course, because Canada have been the second largest diaspora of Ukrainians, but also because Canada is seen as a very strong ally. Chevalier, I should get you to weigh in on that because Matthew, uh, Matthew was a good conservative, but I don't think um, even conservative foreign ministers like your former boss were immune from his criticism that Canada talked too much and did too little. What do you think? I think in the modern age, Canada sitting on $3 trillion of natural resources in energy and in food, that solves many of the world's problems. We've seen what Ian described earlier is a reorganization of the pact between European states uh, on energy. Germany's built ports and pipeline infrastructure in the last several months as a result of Russia's invasion. Canada has all of these solutions. We can be a long-term provider of uh, green, clean, Canadian, made in Canada energy. And we have not stepped up to deliver that uh, long-term supply, not just to partners in Europe who are yearning to get off of Russian dependency, but emerging countries across uh, the Indo-Pacific that are looking for how to fuel their own growth. I'm not just talking about oil and gas, I'm talking about nuclear energy transition technologies. Uh, so I think that you know, if we were to actually measure up with our deeds to our words, then we would dig deep and do the reorganizing uh, of our own eco economic production in ways that actually solves the world's problems rather than uh, do some of the more performative stuff that we've seen come from Ottawa in the last little while. All right, since you mentioned the Indo-Pacific, let's move our focus now to uh, Asia, in fact. And uh, Ian, I'll pick up with you. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party last year gave President Xi Jinping uh, an unprecedented third term. Basically, everybody thinks he's going to be the, the boss for life now. How solid does he look right now? Looks incredibly solid. Uh, the problem, though, is, is more similar to the Russia problem than we'd like, which is when you have a leader that controls that much authority and no longer gets good inputs from technocrats, from experts around them, uh, they can make really big mistakes. Putin's big mistake was the biggest misjudgment we've seen by any major leader since the wall came down in 89. Xi Jinping hasn't made a mistake, thankfully, of that scale yet, but his decision to completely 180 from zero COVID, which he was telling all the world leaders this was the most successful policy, to one of the most open policies um, on COVID domestically, without any preparation with his own policy leaders internally in China. This is now, once again, China is once again, like it was in the beginning of 2020, the epicenter of COVID globally. And like it was in 2020, it's providing no data to other countries around the world, no transparency. That's an immensely dangerous position for China to be in globally. And what Xi Jinping can do on uh, COVID, he can do with his economy, he can do with national security. None of us should be happy with what's happening domestically in China right now. Jennifer, let me get you to weigh in in terms of uh, how Canada is handling China right now. And let me set this up by saying, you know, this the, this current government came into power uh, saying that we needed to dramatically improve our relationship with China, dramatically compared to the previous uh, government of Stephen Harper. We've gone from that to, in the recent Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, the government describing China as an increasingly disruptive global power. Uh, the government made the decision to ban Huawei on the 5G network. There's the two Michaels. Things look pretty bad right now in terms of our bilateral relations. But I wonder, I wonder how you regard this kind of change of tone and pace that the government's taking towards China these days. I think it's been a really significant change. And it's a change that runs across our political class and our population. If you look at public opinion polls, 
in Canada, the, the Canadian population's attitudes towards China have really shifted too. But the Indo-Pacific strategy that you referenced earlier, I think is a reflection of the change in the political class to, and it's been very slow and some would say too late to really try to define our place in a world that is much more polarized. And a, a world that is much more polarized is difficult for Canada. And so that strategy initially, it took five years for it actually to be completed. And you might even argue that some of it already feels dated um, with the language that it uses. But it is pretty significant in calling China disruptive power. But the other thing it does, and Shuvaloy alluded to this, is it tries to make the argument, and I agree with this, that for Canada, Asia is not all about China. We need to be thinking about our relationship more broadly with key allies there for us, like South Korea, for example, Vietnam, a country we've had long ties with, that we need to think about the region as a whole, because of course it is grappling uh, both with China's more assertive position, uh, but also with the United States that is becoming uh, more, more hard in its uh, relationship with China every day. So I think the strategy tries to be more comprehensive, and for that I would give it good marks. Uh, but I think our wanting to, you know, place our flag down and say we're in the region now uh, may for others look too little and too late. Chivaloy, let me get you to follow up on that by pointing out that over the last five years, China's military spending has risen by 25 percent. That's caused a lot of concern in the West. They are spending money on things like offensive amphibious assault weapons overseas occupation hardware. There's increasing concern about whether or not an invasion against Taiwan is coming. How much, in your view, should all of that concern us? I think it should be a central feature of what Ottawa thinks about. I mean, what we've seen is a reluctant admission of the realities that the rest of the world has already conceded when it comes to China. Um, and that's, that's a good step. So I'm glad that we agree that China is a disruptive power. But what I'd love to see is a more confident assertion of what Canada as an Indo-Pacific partner would look like. Um, and that's not just working with traditional alliances. I mean, we've seen in NATO that Japan and South Korea had been around the table in the Madrid dialogue last year. Um, with, it, it's creating the concept of a Pacific front for NATO. Um, it's uh, our own Arctic is engaged in the concept of how China and Russia are partnered all right, let's move on now to the Middle East, and in particular in Iran. And, Liz, I wonder if you'd pick up the story with that country. Protests are now entering their fifth month. I wonder, in your view, how solid that country's theocratic regime now looks. I think it would be rash to predict the end of the Islamic uh, Republic, but and, but even if we don't see regime change, we are certainly seeing already changes in the regime. The, Iran is a country which has seen many protests, protests in the, in the millions in the streets on various issues, but it has never seen these kinds of protests where there are teenagers, girls um, in their early teens, ripping off their obligatory head covers, smashing photographs of the, of the spiritual leader, the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, where women have been going out in large numbers across the country, leading uh, the protests, throwing their headscarves into bonfires. They, there are now large areas of Iran where women go about not wearing the headscarf, which only months ago was certain to land them in jail and still does sometimes land them in jail. So this has, this has certainly rattled the Islamic Republic, but the power that really counts is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and they have not been using their full force to crush these protests, partly because even they feel ambivalent about crushing a protest which is predominantly young women, but for them, the red line is the survival of the Islamic Republic. So I think in 2023, we're going to see this ugly, brutal, violent standoff continuing in different parts of the country. And we must remember, too, that there are other threads which feed into this, whether it's longstanding dis disputes among the Baluch or among the Kurds, which are very organized. Have There's been separatist groups there along straddling the Iraq border for a very long time. Uh, but it's hard to see 
where this is going to go. And of course, in the background is what is understood to be the ill health of the Supreme Leader. So I think Iran is certainly a country to watch this year. Indeed, lots to consider. Ian, I wonder what you think the United States ought to do, because the, you know, the, the, the concern is that if the U.S. gets too involved, this looks like an American operation. But if they don't get involved, uh, we're not sure that, the, that those against the current government in Iran can actually bring about the kind of revolutionary change that's necessary. What do you think? Publicly, the Iranians are already blaming the United States, Israel, and Saudi Arabia for uh, actively uh, supporting uh, domestically uh, these demonstrators and helping to uh, threaten the regime. Uh, I'm I'm not as concerned uh, about how the regime will react. It's more a question of the United States not doing this sort of thing very well. Um, and so certainly diplomatically, publicly providing support for a democratic movement that is being uh, abused. Uh, is something the United States should be doing, something Canada should be doing. I think, importantly, in the near term, the Iranian nuclear deal is dead, in part because mm -hmm. the Iranians don't want to show weakness and compromise, but in part because the Americans cannot be in a position where they are providing significant cash um, and reducing sanctions against a regime that is capable and prepared to do this kind of violence against their own population. I see everyone nodding along with me here. So that, that's one issue. And the fact that we have a new Israeli hardline government that does not want the Iranians to move ahead with their nuclear program, and they're closer to nukes right now than we've ever seen before. The Saudis also deeply concerned about that. We have to recognize that the risk here is not just about what happens if the Iranian regime starts to crumble. It's also what happens if we have direct military confrontation in the Middle East. And as you asked, the United States is further away from that. Uh, they're more, much more focused and engaged on what's happening in Ukraine, the alliances in Europe. They're also much more focused on dealing with the Chinese and the alliances in Asia. The Middle East has gotten shorter shrift from the Biden administration in the past couple of years. And I expect that's going to continue, even given what's happening right now in Iran. Shuvaloy, do you think the return of Benjamin Netanyahu to the prime minister's office in Israel brings Israel and Iran closer to conflict? I don't see the Israeli uh, uh, government uh, as the source of instability. It's the Iranian regime that creates the instability across the region, which actually had been a uniting feature for Netanyahu's diplomacy that resulted in the Abraham Accords. Um, and I think as we start seeing those um, peace treaties with Israel and its wider Arab partners begin to take deeper root, uh, these are all very ambitious agreements that are actually being animated by uh, material things. No, I take your point. And, and to be clear, I wasn't implying that Netanyahu's uh, return to office was somehow responsible for increased instability in the Middle East. But, but I do wonder, Jennifer, maybe you could give me 30 seconds on this before we go to our last question. I, I do wonder whether, now that there is a more bellicose government in Jerusalem, whether these two countries are closer to war. Look, the, in October of 2023, the UN restrictions on Iran's ballistic missiles lapse. And this is of concern to the United States and to Israel because of their concerns about Iran's proliferation, but also supply, supply of weapons for Ukraine. And so in response to that, the US may try to kickstart sanctions. And in response to that, Iran might withdraw from the NPT. And after that, will there be escalation through action by Israel? I, I think it's not impossible for that to happen. And that's something I'm certainly going to be watching for in 2023, is how that dynamic plays out. Well, that's going to lead us nicely to our last segment here. And it's uh, very short, maybe 20 seconds for each of you. On one prediction in a, in a very unpredictable world that you see happening in 2023. Lee, start us off. On battlefields and playing grounds, you're going to see a standoff, a very ugly and very violent one everywhere from uh, Ukraine to Iran. But I'd like to believe, stubbornly believe, that there will be the bright light, the spirit of the women of Afghanistan and Iran taking to the streets to, to fight for their rights, and the spirit of hopefully not just the young generation in calling for action about the crisis we haven't really discussed in detail, and that is a climate crisis. Right. Jennifer, to you. I'm watching the climate crisis. For me, the other event uh, alongside Ukraine were the floods in Pakistan. 
uh, displacing hundreds of thousands, putting so many in humanitarian need. I think this is a snapshot of what we are going to begin to see around the world. And that acceleration in catastrophic risk that I talked about at the very beginning, I think is the continued story. And it will intersect with the real economic crisis we have in lots of parts of the world as a result of food insecurity and inflation. Shivaloy. I, I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I'm looking out for is how um, increasing economic polarization uh, will fuel um, instability, both in democracies, but also in authoritarian regimes. The good news is in democracies, we have the institutions and the modalities to adjust. In autocracies, usually these types of events lead to cataclysmic, unpredictable change. And whether that results um, with a tightening Russian economy in uh, a fractured Russian federalism uh, or in China with lower growth numbers than expected, with even more upheaval, um, how these authoritarian leaders would act in response to those economic uh, pressures are, are ones that I'm, I'm watching very carefully. Ian Bremer, you're batting cleanup. Uh, I think the Turing test will be decisively broken in 2023, where human beings will not be able to differentiate when they are communicating by text with another human or with an AI-powered bot. And I think the implications of that um, for disinformation, for polarization in politics, and also for disrupting the marketplace well beyond anything we've seen before is uh, we're not prepared for, and I think we're going to experience in short order. On that ominous note, Mr. Director, can I have a four-shot? There we go, from left to right, top to bottom. Shuvaloy Majumder, Ian Bremer, Jennifer Welsh, Lise Doucette. It's really good of all four of you to spend so much time with us on TVO tonight. Many thanks and Happy New Year again. Good to be with you. You probably know our next guest as one of the dragons on the CBC show Dragon's Den. What you may not know is that there is a remarkable story behind his current success on Bay Street, a story that starts with unimaginable poverty. He's told his story in a memoir entitled No Bootstraps When You're Barefoot, My Rise from a Jamaican Plantation Shack to the Boardrooms of Bay Street. And with that, we welcome Wes Hall to our studio. It's great to see you. Steve, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Tell me something. Do you, do you think I could uh, rock that pink suit as well as you? What do you think? Well, you know, there's only probably about two or three people in the world <laughs> that can do this. No kidding. And no if you're kidding. one of them, I want to join you, my friend. Uh, uh, let me give you a little secret. I'm not. Yeah. yeah, I'm really not. And at some point, Sheldon, you got to get a shot of these shoes because those are, um, well, yeah, I have not quite seen shoes like that before. And I think our viewers might want to see what they look like, and they look dangerous, Wes. That's all I can say is well, they look dangerous. Let's just say this. Don't get me upset when I'm wearing these shoes, <laughs> no okay? Kidding. No kidding. <laughs> I want to start telling your story here because it's shocking. It's shocking where you started compared mm -hmm. to where you have ended up now. So let's go back. Your mom is 28 years old. Yeah. She's got seven kids, and she abandons all of you. Yes. You're 18 months old. How did you do it? Well, that's the thing. When, when you're 18 months, I, I had no choice. You know, she just, uh, she boiled a pot of porridge and she left it. And she, my sister was four, uh, four years old. So she must have told her that, by the way, when the kids are hungry, feed them. And uh, my brother was six months old. So there we are, three of us in that house, the rest of the kids with my grandmother, and, uh, and she never came back. And uh, so as an 18 month old kid, I'm hungry. And so Ian and I started to cry like really loudly. And my sister Joan, again, only four years old, didn't know what to do because the, the, the pot was empty. And uh, a neighbor came by and heard the commotion, came in, walked to the threshold of the house, because it's a one bedroom place, you can see what's inside. In Jamaica. In Jamaica, in rural Jamaica, and realized that these kids were by themselves in this place. Your father was not there? My father was not there. My father left when I was one to come to Canada. And uh, he was a 24 year old man, and he'd go, I want to discover the world. And, you know, Golden Grove, Jamaica wasn't big enough for me. Hmm. He had ambitions of his own, and he left 
so I was one year, year old, and I st stayed with my mother. Your grandmother saved the day, though. My grandmother was uh, amazing. So when that man came, the man was going by on a bicycle and heard, and he stopped and, and came by, and he goes, okay, I'm gonna go get your grandmother. And uh, my grandmother came with my older sister, uh, Barbara, and a trolley, and uh, load us up and took us to the plantation house that she was raising the rest of the kids, the hmm. grandkids. Now, your mother would drop into your life from time to time yeah. in future years. Yeah. Why is it that your grandmother never read your mother the riot act about <laughs> taking care of her own children? My grandmother kind of did, but didn't. Because, um, so my grandmother would, uh, you know, she would say, listen, you need to take care of your own responsibility, right? So my mother would stop coming to see us. And so she didn't really want to go too hard on her because then she would just never come at all. And so she would, you know, you need to look after your kids, you need to, but then she would just pull back. And uh, so, but my, even with that, my mother would only show up literally to see us for like about 10 or 15 minutes. Until the day when she finally showed up and said, Wes, yeah. you're coming with me. You're anointed. You know, you are anointed to come to live with me. Now, what, what precipitated that? I didn't know at the time. I didn't know at the time, but... And you're how old when this happens? 11. So everybody was saying, take one of the girls. The boy will look after himself. He's going to work on the plantation. He's going to be fine. But your girls are going to get pregnant, and you need to protect them. So take one of the girls. And she wouldn't have any of it. She would go, nope, I want Wes. I want Wes. And I thought I won the lottery. You didn't, Wes. I did not win the lottery. Wes, she beat you, she humiliated you, she was a misery to you. Yeah. Have you forgiven your mother for all of this over the years? Oh, absolutely. It, you know, I, I have because there's no reason why you should harbor resentment. My grandmother taught me that. My grandmother wasn't resentful to any of her kids for leaving all their kids with her to look after on a plantation worker salary. She never a day was resentful, nor did she resent us as a result. So she was, uh, she epitomizes forgiveness. So to me, I wanted to be like her. And you really did it. And I did, I did. I wanted to, my grandmother had four children, all with the same man. And when that man became an alcoholic, she kicked him out of the house because she go, I don't want you to corrupt my kids, my grandkids. She kicked him out. He would show up every now and then and uh, hang out with us and so on, but she would have nothing to do with him at all. And she looked after those four kids on her own, and then they became adults. But one of those kids was special needs, my aunt uh, Daphne. And she looked after her until the day she died at 97 years old. My grandmother died at 97. Amazing. She was committed. And so she wasn't promiscuous. She didn't abuse us. So I spent almost 11 years watching that behavior. And that informed the person that I would become later on in life. You figured out right from wrong by I watching I figured it out really quickly. I yeah. figured out how to behave. She never treated us poorly. She never let us feel as if we're a burden you know, to her. Mm. But yet, when I went to live with my mom, I was a burden. I was clearly a burden, but I couldn't understand why she would want to keep me around mm. until I found out later on, it was my dad who was in Canada that she was pining for for all this time, saying, where's Wes? Wes is still at the grandmother's. You need to go get him, and he needs to be with you. Well, eventually, 1985, you do come to Canada to be with your father yeah. and to meet a bunch of siblings that you didn't really know at all. Didn't know. How did that transition go from Jamaica to Toronto? Well, it, it was interesting because when I was in Jamaica, I was, uh, my mom kicked me out at 13, so that's when all the abuse and the beating stopped, and it was the happiest day of my life, by the way, hmm. because even though I was only 13 years old and I, was, I didn't know where I was gonna live, I knew that I wouldn't be subjected to all the things that she was subjecting me to before, the physical and mental abuse that she was putting me through. And um, at 16, keep it living on your own, in 13 to 16, and then 16 years old, my dad goes, hey, I want you to come live with me. And uh, I, 
thought I won the lottery for sure this time. <laughs> this time, this is the real lottery that I won. It's not a fake lottery like going to live with my mom. This was the deal because I get to go to Canada. It wasn't that I get to go to live with my dad this time. Before it was, I get to go live with my mother. This time, I get to go to Canada. And that was the golden ticket for me. This is 37 years ago now. This is 37 years and ago. And you show up with that accent. I did. What did people think of that? Well, everybody, I said, well, what can't understand him. I said, <laughs> they, 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 they couldn't. So I went to, so September 27, 1985, I came here on a Friday. Mm. And on Monday, I was in school. And as you know, when you go to school, before you get to your classes, you meet with a guidance counselor, and they pick your subjects for you. They put me in the ESL program. <laughs> English as a second language. <laughs> and to be clear, it was your first language. It was my first language. But it sounded from different from everybody else. <laughs> it's, okay. it, it had a little accent on it that the guidance counselor goes, I don't know what this guy can, I can't understand this kid. <laughs> you continued to work your way up the food chain, five years at Can West, then you moved to CIBC Mellon. You're managing white guys who are twice as old as you are. How'd that go? That was, I remember my, uh, you know, one of the guys was management in my mid-20s, you know, and uh, he was 55. He's, he's as old as I am now. <laughs> and I could see how he would take exception to that. This young kid, he's been with the company for 30 years, and he now has to report to me. And so he had a problem with that. But then I put myself in his shoes. But he was just giving me the gears every single day. Every single day, he would pack up his bags and he would do it loudly so everybody would see early and would just walk out. And so I go, you know what? I need him more than he needs me. I had a job that I was really over my head. I didn't know how to do. And he's been doing that job for 30 years and I just started. So I'm gonna get him to be an ally. I have to befriend him. So him and I had a come to Jesus conversation <laughs> and I just allowed him to be the boss. So when he walked into a room, automatically clients would assume that he was the boss. He was a middle-aged white man with gray hair, and I was a, a mid-20s black guy. Automatically, they would assume that he is the boss. So I gave them that impression, and I took notes, and he would run the meetings. And ultimately, he started to give me nuggets of knowledge. Wes, here's how you should behave in this situation. When he asked this question, here's how you should respond. And that's how I learned. You know, my ego didn't allow me to prevent myself from learning and moving ahead. Well, at one point, you came to the conclusion, and this is a quote from the book, being black is my superpower, yeah. you said. What did that mean? It means that in a lot of cases, people underestimate you because of the color of your skin, or me anyways and they put their guards down. They don't bring their A game. They just go, he's uneducated, he's not as smart. Uh, all the different things that come into their minds when they think about what a black person can or can't do. And so I'm in an industry whereby if you underestimate somebody, it's just like in a ring with Mike Tyson. <laughs> you underestimate them, you're gonna be- You pay for it. You're gonna be on your back. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then you're gonna find out when they put smelling salt in front of you and you get up and you go, what just happened? Well, you had your hand behind your back and you were being cocky. But the and, fact that you managed to go from working in a chicken factory yeah. to, and I'm not even gonna get to where you are right now, but you moved up the food chain pretty quickly. You know, for, for a 20-something black kid from Jamaica, you did pretty well. To what do you attribute that success? You know, after writing the book and then reading it, I went, how, how did this happen? <laughs> how, this, how did this happen? Everybody goes, tell me, Wes, tell me, give me the secret to your success. I don't think I had any secrets other than the fact that I was able to exploit every single opportunity that was put in front of me. Every single one of them. And you were ambitious. I was ambitious, but think about, you know, when people say the chicken farm, right? I, you know, you work at a chicken farm. I can't believe that. Well, that opportunity could have led me to be the general manager of the chicken farm and potentially the CEO of the company if I'm smart enough. Right. If I'm smart enough and I'm ambitious enough. So it doesn't really matter where you start. So I started in the mailroom. And a lot of people would go, I would never start in a mailroom. But guess what? Look where it got me. So I was able to exploit every single opportunity presented to me when others would go, I would never do that. There is another line in your book where you say, I can tell you for a fact 
black people know when it's about race. How do you know? So, it, I'm driving my car. I have a Ferrari 458 Spider, And I'm driving to the office that was dressed like this without a tie on. And somebody go, stop my car, handed me his business card and go, I'm a criminal lawyer in the city of Toronto. Give me a call if you're looking for a lawyer. Is that about race? I drive that car to the Four Seasons to have lunch with a client. I get out and somebody hand me $20 to valet their car for them. Is that about race? I go to the, uh, I'm traveling, go to the airport, walk into the priority line, just before I hand in my boarding pass, you're in the wrong line, you need, you need to be in the economy line. Is that about race? So a lot of people have explanations to say, maybe it's because you were dressed this way, maybe it's because your car was too flashy, maybe, maybe, maybe. You forgot the best story. You're jogging in your neighborhood with your wife. <laughs> Tell that story. I'm jogging through my neighborhood and my, you know, uh, people would say, are you, could I use your personal trainer one day? To my wife. They think and you're her personal trainer. They think I'm my wife's personal trainer. Or they come to my house and go, go get Mr. Hall for me. Or they ask me, are you the security guard? So, again, you can excuse those behavior every now and then, but all of a sudden, when they just keep on adding on and adding on and piling on and piling on, you go, it's got to be about race. I'm not that naive to think that people are that ignorant. In which case, you start something called Black North Initiative. Yeah. What's that? So, after George Floyd was murdered, I wrote an article, and it was published in uh, one of the major newspapers. And it was on the front page. And it, uh, it was entitled, When I Look in the Mirror, I See George Floyd. Hmm. And in the article, I talked about me experiencing the effect that his murder had on me when I watched that video. And, uh, and I looked and I stood up. I was, everybody was working remotely at the time, virtually. I was in my home office and I stood up after watching the video and there's a mirror in front of me and I literally saw George Floyd looking back at me because what I saw was how I would have been treated had I been in that situation. Nobody would care if I live in one of the fancy neighborhoods in the city if I work on Bay Street, what my bank account balance was, they wouldn't have cared. All they saw was a black man because he was driving a Mercedes Benz and I had one in my driveway. And nobody asked him any questions. So, but I also start to recount my experiences as a black person. And I talk about me jogging through my neighborhood and a white woman fell in front of me and I hesitated to help her because was uh, scared about the potential consequences of me trying to help her. Mm -hmm. What if she was disoriented? Then she started fighting me off. My neighbors were all white because I'm the only black person in the neighborhood. And then all of a sudden the police shows up. We know the stats with respect to how police treat black people. And I have no identification because I was out jogging. I hesitated and I asked the question of my neighbors. How many of you in my position would see someone in need and hesitated because of the potential consequences to you? And so when I wrote that article, I started to get a lot of inbound calls from a lot of corporate leaders saying, Wes, I didn't get it. How can I help you? And at the end of the day, I go, let's start this organization called the Canadian Council of Business Leaders Against Anti-Black Systemic Racism. Mm -hmm. It's a mouthful, let's call it the Black North Initiative. Mm -hmm. And because we're all CEOs, let's agree that we're gonna change the, the, the conversation within our own companies. And we're gonna start at the C-suite level, the board level, the C-suite level, the pipeline, and all aspect, we're gonna look around and go, are there black people here? And if there aren't, why not? And what are we gonna do about it? There are going to be people who will listen to your story, may read the book, and they will say, look where he started, look where he is now. He's a you know, titan on Bay Street, he's got a great TV show. This story proves that Canada is not a racist country because otherwise he'd never been able to achieve what he achieved. Is that the wrong conclusion? It is because I would say point to another. <laughs> you are pretty unique, aren't you? <laughs> it's like, there's not too many. And, uh, and, and so if, if it doesn't exist, there should be so many more uh, of me out there. Do you feel like a unicorn? Uh, in some circles, in some circles, but I also feel that I have a privilege when I'm in those uh, positions of being a unicorn to now educate the people who are gracious enough to allow me in the room to let them know why other people like me should be in the room as well. Hmm. Let's finish up on this. Black North Initiative, 
the idea is out there. You've asked corporate, you've asked political people for support to get it going, mm -hmm. put some oomph into it. How's it going? It's going amazing. Um, when you look at corporate Canada today, the face of corporate Canada is very different than it was in 2020. Two short years, two short years. Just look at the boards, look at the C-suite, look at the universities, the kids graduating, the kids getting jobs, very different. However, there are some out there who believe that we haven't done enough because their expectation is that after 400 years of oppression, that it should be solved in two years by this organization, Black North. Right. That's an offense to all the black people who fought so hard, Martin Luther King Jr. and others, who fought so hard to advance the ball that we're gonna start this organization, Black North, and racism is gonna be eradicated in Canada for good in two years. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna show the cover of this book because that little six, seven-year-old kid from Jamaica is now worth how much? <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more than that. <laughs> a little bit more than he was worth back then. I can't thank you enough for coming in here and telling your story. The book is a great read. Uh, you, you are astonishing. Well, Steve, thank you. Uh, plain and simple. Uh, no bootstraps when you're barefoot. Wes Hall, thank you so much, Wes. Steve, thanks for having me. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, January 4th, 2023. Tomorrow, J.N. Jagannathan will be here with a look at the health care issues that desperately need addressing in this new year ahead. I'm Steve Pagan. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And J.N., we'll see you here tomorrow.